in this lecture we will discuss decidability. Already we have introduced Turing machine as a model of general purpose computer. The notion of algorithm has also been defined in terms of Turing machine by means of search Turing thesis. We will now see that some problems can be solved algorithmically while others cannot. So, it gives us the limits of algorithmic solvability. In decidability, we will consider some example of languages that are decidable by algorithms. That is, there are Turing machines to decide those languages. Of course, while giving Turing machines as algorithms, that means decider Turing machines, rather than spelling out the full specification of Turing machines, that means the states, transition functions, etcetera, we provide only a high level description, where we use English prose to describe an algorithm, ignoring the implementation details. That means, we do not mention how the Turing machine manages step or head. We now consider some example languages that are decidable. We consider languages to represent various computational problems just for our convenience. So, first we see uh, problems from regular languages itself. So, first let us consider membership problem of for regular languages. So, the problem is that given a string x belonging to sigma star for some sigma and a regular language L over that alphabet, whether or not the string x belongs to L. So, there is a problem. So, this problem, the corresponding language for this problem can be stated as M R L, which is the set of all strings like this. So, A x such that A is a DFA and uh, x belongs to L of A. So, why we are switching here A to be DFA? Because since we want to see whether x belongs to L or not, we need to give an algorithm. That means, we need to design Turing machine to decide this problem. Now, we have to give a description of the language to the Turing machine. So, how should we describe this language, how this description of the language should be given to the Turing machine as input is the main problem, because language may be infinite. So, we need to have some finite representation of the language, so that we can give it as an input. So, there are different kinds of finite representations. For example, so we have a regular expression, by using regular expression we can give or represent the uh, any language or we can also use a finite automata for example, say DFA to describe the language. So, here we will consider final automata to describe the language. So, therefore, this A x, this is the string where A is the encoding of the DFA and x is a string. So, the problem is the language of problem is the set of all st strings like this A x in encoding such that A is a DFA and x belongs to L of A. Now, since we have said that we need to give an encoding of A that means, the DFA we first consider how to encode a given DFA A. Let us see the encoding of DFA or coding of a DFA. So, if A is a DFA, then corresponding encoding will be written as A within angular bracket. So, that is why we have written here in the language as A x within angular bracket. So, these are encoding. Consider for example, this DFA, where we have two states Q 1 and Q 2 and the inputs are from the alphabet 0 1. So, this is a corresponding transition function delta, it has only one, it has a single 
one initial state q 1 and only one final state that is q 2. From the transition function, we all these transition functions can be represented as triplets say first one q 1 on input 0 it goes to q 1. So, we represent like this q 1 0 q 1. Second one is that q 1 on 1 goes to q 2. So, q 1 1 q 2 like that we can also represent the other two transitions. Now, we give a encoding of this d f a using strings over 0 and 1. So, to start with the left bracket we represent using 3 zeros and then since we have finite numbers of states we will be using say if we have q 1, q 2 up to say q k we use a sequence of 1s to represent the states that means 1 to the power i will be represented will be used to represent the state q i. Similarly, to represent the symbol from the alphabet again we use sequence of 1s only for example, say a 1, a 2, say a m these are symbols from the alphabet then we will be using 1 to the power i to represent the symbol a i. Therefore, we can now encode every transition like this. So, after 3 zeros which denote a denote the left bracket. So, q 1 will be denoted as 1 to the power i that means 1. Now, next we will use 0 as a separator. After using 0 here as a separator, we use single symbol say 1 to the power i that means one to only 1 to denote 0 and then again 0 as a separator then 1 to represent q 1. So, 1 0 1 0 1 this is the code for a corresponding transition q 1 0 q 1. Then this transition will be separated from the other transitions by 2 zeros over here and then for this transition q 1 will be represented by 1 separated by 0 then this symbol 1 will be written by 2 ones because there are two symbols 0 and 1. 0 will be written by 1 and 1 will be written by 1 1. And then q 2 will be written by 2 ones 1 3 power 2 because there are two states q 1 and q 2. For q 1 we have single 1 and for q 2 we have 2 ones. So, this is a code for this particular transition. Next, it will be separated by again 2 zeros and this will be code accordingly for this transition 2 zeros again to separate and this will be the code for the corresponding transition over here. Then again we will use 3 zeros to indicate that we have no more transitions over here all the trans transitions have been encoded and then we indicate the set of final sets after this. So, since q 2 is the final set, so we use 2 ones according to our notations for q 2 we have 2 ones and then we use 3 zeros to indicate that there is no more final sets over here. So, this is the encoding for the d f a a. So, in general if we have a d f a having finite numbers of states q 1 through q 1 q n finite numbers of symbols a 1 through 
say n delta is a transition function q 1 is the initial state and is a set of final states over here q i 1 q i 2 up to q i k. What we do is that q i will be written by 1 to the power i d string and a i will be written by 1 to the power i d strings and if t 1 t 2 t r are the transitions then the d f a is dependent by 3 zeros the coding code of t 1 2 0 then the code of t 2 again 2 0 the code of t 3 and so on up to the code of t r the r f transition then 3 zeros to indicate that there is no more transition and then 1 to the power i 1 to indicate that this is a final set q i 1 is a final set 0 1 to the power i 2 q i 2 is a final set and so on up to q i k to indicate that q i k q i 1 q i 2 up to q i k these are the final states and eventually 3 zeros to indicate the end. So, that is how we represent or encode any given DFA. So, once we have encoded what we do? We use a Turing machine. So, this encoding of A along with after the encoding what we have say this is the encoding of A. We had 0 0 0 T 1 0 0 and so on 0 0 T R 0 0 0 1 to the power I 1 0 1 to the power I 2 0 up to your 1 to the power I k 0 0 0 and after this we after this we place the string x whatever it may be. So, it is again a sequence of 0 and 1 s 0 1 or whatever is a sequence of 0 and 1 s. So, this overall will give us the string a x. So, therefore, that is how we give the input to the Turing machine. So, we consider for simulation we consider a four type Turing machine. On the first step we place the string encoding of Turing machine along with the string that means encoding of A and X together where dollar is a first symbol. On the second step we put. So, initially the what a Turing machine can do? It can look for the first group of three zeros, second group, group of three zeros, and finally last group of three zeros. Once it gets the last group of three zeros, the third group of three zeros, it knows that there is no more final sets, and whatever is there after this will be the string x. So, once it can identify the string x, it can copy that string x from the first step to the second step. So, in a number of steps the Turing machine can copy the second component that means the string to the second step. Now, in the fourth step the Turing machine again can find out or identify all the final states of that DFA and it can copy on the third step the final states of the DFA. And the third step will be considered as a current step or that means a step which is used for simulation of the Turing machine. Now, we will give the algorithm for MRL. To do that, we need to know how the Turing machine will simulate the behavior of the DFA and it will say yes, whenever 
the DFA eventually accepts the string x and it will say no whenever the DFA does not accept the string x. So, the Turing machine will first see put the initial state that means the 1 because q 1 is the initial state that is why it will put 1 in the third step in the simulation step. Then looking at the symbol the first symbol of x. So, it is it knows that it is in state current state is q 1 you will first see what is the current state a current symbol from the second step. Therefore, from the first step which is an encoding mode Turing machine which contains the transitions of the DFA, it will see what is your q 1 if the first symbol of x is suppose say 0, it will see what is the third component in that transition in, 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 in the transition which is there available in the first step. So, accordingly if it is q 1, it will print 1 over here in the third step otherwise if you say it is q 2, then it will print 2 ones over here on the third step. To indicate that the DFA has changed its state to q 2 according to the transition function given on the first step in the encoding. So, this will be continued in this way looking at the symbols of the second step, the current state in the third step and any transition matching the current state and the current symbol. It will keep on changing the state in the third step. So, eventually whenever the input string is exhausted then the Turing machine will check the content of the third step. So, it will indicate what is the current state. If that current state you will see whether it is a final state from the fourth step, whether that state belong is, is a state which is there in the third step or fourth step or not. If it is it knows that the input is exhausted and it has entered in a final state. So, therefore, the DFA should accept otherwise the DFA will reject just given string x. So, that is how the Turing machine will simulate the behavior of DFA using a 4 tap Turing machine. So, once you know how it goes you can now give the algorithm for the language MRL. So, in this case the input is of this form A x where A is a DFA and x is the input to the DFA A. So, A x is the encoding is given to the Turing machine. So, Turing machine will either output yes or no. So, if it outputs yes that means, the DFA A accepts the string x, if it outputs no it means that the DFA A rejects the string x. So, in step 1 we will simulate the DFA A on input x. So, it is now quite clear how the DFA how the Turing machine will simulate the DFA A on input x using a 4 tap using its 4 taps. In step 2 if the simulation ends in a final state then the DFA will say yes output yes otherwise it will say that no. So, this is the algorithm for MRL. So, therefore, MRL is decidable that means, the membership, pro membership problem of regular language is decidable. Now, let us see the emptiness problem of regular language. So, in this case the problem is that given a regular language L whether or not L is empty. The corresponding language for this problem is that E R L which is set of all strings A where A is a, N, a, is a DFA and this is an encoding of the DFA and L A is phi that means, it does not accept any string. 
So, for this now we do not give the Turing machine specifically all the states and like that, but simply we will give the algorithm. So, in this case the input is d f a a which is having the state q input symbol sigma delta is a transient function q naught is the initial state and f is the set of states. So, it is a d f a is the input and output is again yes or no depending on whether l of a is phi or l of a is not phi. In the first step what the machine can do it will mark the initial step of the d f a. So, there is a single initial step it will mark the step. In step 2, the, D, the Turing machine will repeat step 3 until no new state gets marked. So, step 3 is that if a state p is already marked, suppose p is already marked state, then if delta p a equal to q, so this can be determined from the first step where the description of the or the encoding of the DFA is available. If delta p a is equal to q, then it will also mark q, because p is already marked on some symbol it goes to q, then it will mark q as well. So, this step will be continued until no more, no new states gets marked. So, eventually when it comes out from step 3, if no final state is marked, it means that the DFA cannot enter in any of the final states. In such a case, it will say yes, that means it will not accept any string. Otherwise, it will say no, that means the DFA accepts some string. That means the language of the DFA is not empty. Now, there is an alternative way to solve the same problem, that means to decide the same problem, that means the emptiness problem the alternative way we can prove it by means of these two theorems or constructed from these theorems. Suppose, there is d f a with n states and l is the language accepted by the d f a. Now, we can prove that l is not equal to phi if and only if a accepts a string of length less than n. So, this we have kept it kept as exercise, you can prove it easily by using pumping lemma. Already pumping lemma for regular language have been discussed and you can apply that pumping lemma for regular languages to prove that L is not empty if and only if the DFA accepts some string of length less than n. Similarly, the second theorem says that L is infinite if and only if A accepts a string x whose length is greater than or equal to n or less than twice n, where n is the number of states of course. So, we can use the first theorem to prove that or to decide whether the language of a DFA is empty or not. That means, emptiness of regular languages, whether it is decidable or not. So, in this case, the Turing machine basically can list out all the strings of length less than n. So, there are finite numbers of strings like that uh, of length at most n, and all these strings can be generated on, the, on one type of a Turing machine. And then the Turing machine can simulate the DFA on that string. So, it will continue for to generate the strings of length up to n and then test it or run the simulation or, or simulate the behavior of the DFA whether it accepts or not. So, eventually if the DFA accepts any string of length at most n or less than n, then it can determine it can decide that it can output that L not equal to empty, otherwise it is empty. So, similarly since there are finite numbers of strings of length greater than equal to n and less than twice n, 
because numbers of states in the DFA is finite. So, Turing machine can always generate all those strings on one of its step one by one systematically and then verify by simulating the DFA on that string whether it accepts or not. If any one of the strings is accepted by the DFA whose length is greater than equal to n or less than twice n, then it can decide that the language of the DFA is infinite. So, whether a given regular language is infinite, that means the corresponding for it, this problem, the corresponding language is I R L, the encoding of DFA A such that A is a DFA and L A is infinite. So, you can show that I R L is decidable by constructing a Turing machine, which will output yes or no accordingly. Now, let us see the problem of equivalence of two regular languages. The problem is that given two regular languages L 1 and L 2, is L 1 equal to L 2, whether they are identical. The corresponding language is that is equivalence of regular language given two DFS A and B, these are encoding of DFA A B. So, A and B are DFS and L A equal to L B, whether they accept the same language or not. So, these are corresponding language problems. Now, to solve this problem or to decide this language, we will first construct a new DFA, which is say C from this given DFA A and B, such that C accepts only those strings accepted by either A or B, but not by both. That means, language of C is written as L of A interaction complement of L B union complement of L A interaction L of B. This is what is called the symmetric difference of A and B. Now, given a DFA A, we know how to construct the DFA which accepts the complement of L of A. So, A is the DFA, L of A is the language accepted by the DFA. So, complement of L of A will be accepted by that DFA, where we just intersense the final states and non final states. All the non final states will be final state and the final set will be non final state. So, that new DFA will accept the complement of the previous DFA. So, therefore, from B we know how to construct the DFA which accepts complement of L B. Similarly, from A we know how to construct the DFA which accepts complement of L A. Similarly, we have given the procedure to construct intersection of two DFS, similarly the union of two DFS. So, therefore, we know how to construct the DFA C, which is a symmetric difference of A and B. Now, if we see carefully, the language of C is phi will find that language of C is phi if and only if the language of A, language accepted by A and language accepted by B are identical. So, therefore, this problem now reduces the problem of whether L A equal to L B reduces to, reduces to problem of finding whether L C equal to phi or not. Now, what you can do? We can now just use the same algorithm for emptiness that we have already given over here. So, the 
algorithm for emptiness to determine whether L c equal to phi or not. So, therefore, if L c equal to phi then L a equal to L b otherwise L a is not equal to L b. So, that way you can determine whether the problem of equivalence of regular languages we can say that the problem of equivalence of regular languages are decidable. So, after considering the problems from regular language let us now consider the membership problem of context free language. That means, the problem is that given a string x over sigma star for some sigma and a context free language l over that sigma whether or not x is a member of l the same problem similar to the membership problem of regular languages. Only thing is that here the language is CFL context free. The corresponding language is that is m c f g. In this case we represent the language by giving the corresponding context free drummer. In case of regular languages we used d f a as input. So, in this case we use uh, the corresponding grammar g as input. So, in this case whenever you, we say that we use angular bracket it shows that this is encoding of the g and the given string x. The way we have given the encoding for a DFA can also be extended to give an encoding of any given grammar. So, therefore, we assume that such an encoding exists, it is possible. So, this g x is the string, a set of all strings g x, the language that set of all strings g x, where g is the grammar c f g and x is a string and here g is c f g and x is a string such that x belongs to L of g. So, these are corresponding language for this given membership problem of C F L. Now, let us see whether it is decidable. We can show that this is decidable by giving an algorithm. Now, in this case what you can do in a for the algorithm the input you consider as a C F g g and the string x, but here we assume that the x is not equal to epsilon. If the string is epsilon, then we can easily determine whether it belongs to the grammar g or not by looking at the productions. Then you can really find out whether that epsilon belongs to the language or not by lo simply looking at the production. Now, the Turing machine will simply output yes or no dep depending on whether x belongs to the language or not. In the first step, we convert the C f g g to C n f. We know that in C n f all productions of the form a goes to b c that means, the right hand side we can have only two non terminals or a goes to say a single symbol this kind of productions are allowed in C n f. So, since this is the case if we have a string say x of length n you can show that to derive this string x of length n using this grammar if x really belongs to L then it will take no more than 2 n minus 1 steps. So, maximum number of steps it may take is 2 n minus 1, because the right hand side of every production is of length at most 2, where both are non terminals. So, after converting the grammar g to C n f, because this algorithm we have already given in the context of your simplification of context free grammars. So, we list or the Turing machine list all derivations with 2 n minus 1 steps, where n is number of length of the string. Once it is done, once it knows all the derivations of length with 
2 n minus 1 steps. If any one of these derivations generate this string x, then the three dimensional output yes. Otherwise, that means none derives the string x, the three dimensional will output no, that means it is not accepted. So, therefore, the membership problem of CFG or context free language is decidable since we have a algorithm to decide it.